everybody, this is Meredith from the Witty Gritty Paper Co. And today we are going to be talking all about watercolor ground. So if you've never heard of watercolor ground, basically it is a paste-like substance that you can apply to other substances, um, <laughs> other surfaces, and it'll create a paper-like texture that you can watercolor on. So it has two sort of different uses. The one thing you can do with it is you can um, apply it on top of a mistake in a painting. So say you do a landscape painting that you like and there's just like this one area where you felt like you lost the lights or whatever. If there's just one area of the painting you don't like but the rest of it you really like um, and it's sort of ruining, for, ruining it for you, you can open up your ground and apply it to the area that you're displeased with, wait for it to dry, and watercolor on top of it like a redo. So that's one use. The other thing you can do with it is you can put it on surfaces that normally you wouldn't be able to watercolor on, um, like metal or glass or wood, and it'll give you a watercolor uh, surface. So let's talk about applying it for a second. You might remember um, I did a haul video last year and I featured this jar here that I bought. Um, it's made by Core. They make paint too and it's cold press watercolor ground. So it's watercolor ground with a specific texture. When it dries, it's supposed to look and feel like cold pressed paper. So if you look at it, it's sort of um, pasty uh, in texture and um, it kind of reminds me of like spackle. If you ever do any DIY stuff, it's sort of the consistency of that. And then this other little jar here um, is made by Daniel Smith. This is also watercolor ground, but this watercolor ground is black. So the actual watercolor ground itself is black. And I thought it was so cool that I just had to have it. Um, the texture of this one is a little bit thinner. I would say it's probably more like a sort of craft acrylic paint. Um, it doesn't have any specific texture. Like this is supposed to be cold pressed, but this is just plain watercolor ground. And I looked into it. Uh, Daniel Smith actually makes a bunch of colors of this. They make um, a gold, they make an iridescent pearl, they make like two different whites, um, and then the black. So very interesting possibilities uh, here from Daniel Smith. And um, Core also makes, I believe, a hot press ground and maybe even a rough ground too. Um, so let's talk about applying it. So you would just open it up and I would recommend that you use a palette knife. This is what I used. Um, you could also use a butter knife in a pinch, but you should definitely either wash it thoroughly or um, have one just dedicated to applying watercolor ground because it is an art material. You don't want it mixing with your food. Um, but a palette knife would probably be the best tool. Um, I wouldn't really recommend that you use a paintbrush because although this one is particularly uh, pasty, they're both viscous and um, I think that you might struggle to get enough of it onto a surface with a paintbrush before it starts to dry and act strange. So definitely recommend that you use a palette knife for applying it. Um, and as far as thick and thin goes, um, it kind of depends on the ground. Like this one needed a thicker coat than this one, but uh, neither of them need like super thick coats. So I decided to see how many different surfaces uh, the watercolor ground would work on. I wanted to test it out and see if it really was um, something that would allow me to watercolor on any surface. So I started with stone. This is my first experiment. Um, these are some slate coasters that I picked up and the one on the right has the black watercolor ground on it and the one on the left has the white core cold press ground on it. And as you can see, I painted some little mushrooms on them. And I was sort of pleasantly surprised at how well this worked. So first of all, though, I would like to say that to the touch, neither of the grounds feel like paper. Um, they feel really rough and hard, actually. They feel like a stone, um, and not just because they're on top of slate. <laughs> That's just the way that they feel. Uh, so if you're expecting it to feel just like paper, um, it's not going to. So just, just a side note there, but I thought it worked pretty well. Um, the one on the right with the black watercolor ground, I used white ink and mixed it with my watercolors to have them show up because regular watercolors wouldn't show up on top of black because they're transparent. Um, so I had to make some opaque ones by adding some white ink. I also used a little bit of gouache um, in some of these samples, but that was stone. 
which it worked fine on. And then I tried out plastic. So these are two more, as you can see, plastic. <laughs> um, and once again, they, they feel rough to the touch. So it's not about what you apply them to. This is just the texture of the ground. It's going to feel sort of rough and stone-like. Um, but they worked really well. Uh, once again, the paint didn't resist or anything. Um, I was happy with the way they came out. Uh, this one on the left though, this is when I started to notice something interesting about the white textured watercolor ground. And that was that, um, if you look at the edge, the left edge of this flower, uh, it's sort of rough. Um, and that's because some of the paint started to sort of bleed out into the texture of the ground itself. Um, so the divots are so dramatic in this textured ground that I actually found it kind of difficult to get a straight line with it. Um, but it's not, it's not a big deal. It's just something to be aware of. Um, and that proved true in some of my other samples too. The next thing I tried was wood. Um, once again, pretty standard. This was the first time that I completely covered the white with watercolor. And once again, I didn't really run into any issues. It didn't like resist um, or beat up or anything. Um, but I also discovered in the process of this that watercolor does basically instantly stain wood. Um, so that's good to know if you're planning to use it on wood is if you make a mistake and get a little bit on the wood, um, you're probably not going to be able to get it out again. But other than that, pretty standard. Uh, it worked pretty equally well on almost everything I tried it on. Um, the next thing I tried it on was glass um, because the, uh, let me stack some of these up here. The one watercolor ground, this one, the black one, has a ton of instructions on the side that um, say things like it'll work better on abrasive surfaces and you need to wait 24 to 72 hours before painting on it. Um, so I actually pushed both of those recommendations. Um, first of all, I applied it and then I just started painting on it when it looked dry to me which was only about five hours after I had applied it to these surfaces. So I didn't even wait half of the minimum recommended time for this. Um, and I haven't incurred any negative results, but I would say that if you live somewhere particularly humid, um, or if it's just hot outside, the ground may take a lot longer to dry. Um, but I didn't suffer any adverse effects from only waiting a couple hours, but it does say to wait 24 to 72. I didn't, but I could see there probably would be some situations where that would be um, necessary. But, uh, so that, that really wasn't entirely true in my um, circumstance. And the fact that it says it, it um, should be used on abrasive surfaces, I tried it out on glass. So this is completely smooth glass. It's not abrasive at all. And the ground, both of them, is still completely stuck to it. No problem, no peeling, nothing weird. Um, Basically, it stuck to everything that I tried it on. Um, that wasn't that wasn't an issue. And with these two on the glass, I also tried to um, sort of push the limits of its transparency a little bit more. So on the right, you can see there are actually there's a super faint fourth row of mountains out there, but there are four layers on the right sample. And on the left, again, playing with transparency. Um, this was the sample that I realized. Uh, or when I realized um, that the white watercolor ground, paint on it takes a lot longer to dry. So um, it took a lot longer to dry than like average watercolor paper. So this sample probably took me the longest because um, there was just so much waiting time in between uh, the diamonds um, for me to be able to paint on top of them without them just bleeding into each other. So it does work um, for transparency. You can layer um, successfully, but it does take longer to dry, um, which I think is sort of, sort of interesting. It does dry, but it does take longer to dry. <laughs> um, the second to last thing I tried it on was fabric. Now this I was really curious about. Um, these little guys are actually shoulder pads, um, and I just thought they were the perfect size for trying this out. Um, but the watercolor ground, much to my amazement, stuck to both of them and worked pretty much just as well as it worked on every other surface. Um, the only thing I would say, though, is that the uh, the seam in the middle of these definitely caused some issues for me. Um, and the other thing is, I'm not sure that fabric is the best choice for this because the smoother that the surface you're working on is, um, pretty much the better with watercolors because watercolors don't 
um, don't just stay in place by themselves. You know, there's a reason that we don't paint watercolors um, upright on an easel, and that's because they would drip all over the place and they wouldn't stay in place. That's why we paint flat, so gravity, you know, keeps them in place. Um, so when you're painting on something that has all these uh, sort of wavy little bumps on it, such as these little shoulder pads, um, you know, a lot of the time I was working on them, the paint would, you know, just sort of pool up and not spread out and um, not act like, you know, uh, a piece of paper or even act like the other flat samples. So although it definitely worked on fabric, I would say if you're going to use it on fabric to any great extent, you should try to make it as flat as possible when you're applying it um, and have the fabric itself not be particularly textured. Uh, that's another thing. When you are applying the ground, if you leave any streaks in it or any sort of, um, you know, areas where it's thicker uh, as opposed to the other side's thinner, um, those are going to stay <laughs> as it dries. So it's not a self-leveling product. Um, however flat that you apply it, that's the same amount of flat that it's going to stay. So that's important to know. You could actually build up some interesting texture if you were going for that but um, but it's not self-leveling. So you do have to put in a little uh, TLC with your palette knife to make sure you get it as smooth as possible. The last surface that I tried the watercolor ground on was metal. So this is a galvanized metal tray and um, I covered the top half of it with the white watercolor ground and the bottom half with the black. And I did sort of a primitive um, night and day skyline of Rio de Janeiro. And the first thing I would say is, once again, the ground basically performed the same as it did on the other surfaces. I really didn't notice too much difference other than the fabric. I didn't notice too much difference on its ability to stick to these things. Um, it is pretty amazing, actually, that it stuck to all of them. Um, but I will say that it was not the best choice to paint on because having to keep my hand, you know, a solid, like, inch and a half, two inches above what I was doing the whole time definitely... I think made the um, made the art suffer a little bit, but it's still interesting. Um, and the two where they meet in the middle here, they didn't resist each other. Uh, they didn't do anything weird. So that's not to say that you can mix your watercolor ground, but maybe you can if you're feeling adventurous. Um, I see no reason why that uh, off the bat, no reason why that wouldn't work. So this is just my experimentation with watercolor ground so far. Um, I would say though that it is really cool. I'm amazed at how well it worked and I cannot imagine a more powerful tool if you're into mixed media. I mean, you could do some really amazing things. You could also do some really interesting um, exhibition size pieces. You could do some really big pieces and just paint patches of it with the watercolor ground to add some um, interesting elements. And the other cool thing is that both of these jars are probably about still like three quarters full. So it really didn't use that much to do all these different samples. So which was surprising to me. I thought for sure that I would go through at least a little jar um, trying this out, but there's still a lot left um, and a lot of interesting possibilities. Um, so if any of you have experience with like other brands or other colors, um, feel free to let me know in the comments. I don't think this is like the most popular watercolor product, but it has such interesting um, possibilities. Um, and I had a lot of fun playing around with it. So that is everything that I have learned about it so far. Um, if you like this video, I would love if you hit the thumbs up um, and press that subscribe button to see more content like it. And thank you so much as always for watching. Bye.